a long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away. Penguin Random House Audio presents Star Wars Thrawn Treason by Timothy Zahn. Read for you by Mark Thompson. Prologue The Imperial Star Destroyer floated lazily over the blue-green planet below it. A hint of those colors reflected faintly against its hull in the shadows created by the distant sun. The warship reached the end of its patrol sweep and, apparently satisfied that there was nothing amiss in the vicinity, angled away toward deep space. It continued its leisurely course until it reached the edge of the planet's gravity well, then, in a flurry of flashlines, made the jump to light speed. Seated in her command chair, on the bridge of the Chiss Defense Fleet warship Steadfast, wrapped in darkness, alleviated only by the stars outside and the handful of indicator lights still active, Admiral Aralani scowled. The accidental interloper was finally gone. The crucial question now was whether the Steadfast's forced descent into full dark mode had given their quarry the time and distance it needed to escape. Mid Commander Tanik, she prompted quietly. A moment, Admiral, Tanik said softly. There was no real need for quiet. Their quarry could hardly hear them across a thousand kilometers of vacuum. But Aralani had long noted that dark mode tended to have a silencing effect on a ship's crew. Searching along the last known vector. Assuming they didn't take the opportunity to alter it, Senior Captain Kresh growled from his position beside Aralani's chair. Imperial fools! The exact worst time, the exact worst place! Patience, Senior Captain, Aralani admonished gazing out at the star field wrapped around the bridge viewports. She was just as frustrated as Kresh by the Star Destroyer's unexpected and oblivious interference with their mission. But that wasn't a reason to abandon his dignity and self-control. She looked back at the sensor board, especially not with Tanique sitting right there within earshot. Sure enough, the sensor officer had a small smile on his face, as he worked to relocate the Steadfast's target. No doubt the tale of Kresh's small outburst, mild though it might be, would wend its way back to the Ascendancy and there be thrown on the growing fire between their two families. Unfortunately, Kresh also spotted Tanik's smile. Is something amusing you, Meet Commander? He demanded. No, Senior Captain. Nothing at all. Tanik assured him calmly. Have you found the target? If not, I suggest you put thoughts of entertainment out of your mind and concentrate on the task at hand. Yes, sir. Tanik straightened in his chair. Oh, wait, sir, he said with exaggerated brightness. I stand corrected. Admiral, we have them. On the board, Aralani ordered. There! Kresh said, pointing at the glowing circle on the tactical board that marked the drive emissions. Looks like they're maintaining their original heading. Ships uncloaking, Admiral, Tanik said. Still too far away for any configuration analysis. He shook his head. I have to give them full marks for confidence. Confidence bordering on arrogance, Aralani agreed. The target ship had naturally activated its cloaking field the moment the Star Destroyer popped into the system, hiding itself from the potential enemy. But from its current position, it was clear that instead of shutting down its drive and playing dead the way the Steadfast had, 
it had continued to track along its course, fully expecting that the Imperial ship wouldn't notice the telltales. Which, of course, it hadn't. Looks like it's getting ready to jump, Crash said. There it goes! Secure from dark mode, Aralani called. Do we have their vector? We do, Admiral, Tanik said, as all around them the bridge and the steadfast began once again to come to life. Sending it to the helm. Aralani turned her attention to the helm, and the young girl seated quietly in the navigator's seat. Whenever you're ready, navigator Myarik. Yes, Admiral, Myarik said. She braced herself as she took the helm controls, then bowed her head. She held the pose a moment, then drew a breath and huffed it out. A moment later, the steadfast was in hyperspace. Let's just hope they're all as incompetent as the ones in that Star Destroyer, Kresh murmured at Aralani's side. They won't be, Aralani said, trying to hide her own misgivings. Tracking an enemy ship to learn its destination and purpose was one thing. Tracking it across borders toward the very center of alien territory was something else entirely. Signal all senior officers. I want them in the bridge conference room in ten minutes to discuss the current situation. Yes, ma'am, Crash said. And... He left the question hanging. Not that Arlani didn't know perfectly well what he was suggesting. The problem was that the newcomer, the alien, was still not fully accepted by some of the officers and crew. In a crisis situation, or even a politically charged one, lack of trust could lead to hesitation, which could lead to disaster. But she was likely to need information and analysis before this was over. And he was far and away the best resource the Steadfast had. And a good commander never wasted or ignored resources. Yes, she told Kresh. Go ahead and signal him as well. Order Lieutenant Eli Vanto to join us. Chapter 1 Communications to and from a Star Destroyer like the ISD Chimera came from many directions and at many different statuses and security levels. Each message carried a numerical code specifying the degree of importance, and those codes defined how and by whom each was to be handled. Commodore Karin Farrow knew all of those codes, but somehow in a still youthful corner of her mind that years of imperial military regulation and order hadn't quite eradicated, those codes also somehow ended up as colors. Identification signals from nearby ships or status reports from mid-distant bases, routine matters handled by junior officers, came in shades of green or blue. The small percentage of more significant orders and reports from Coruscant which was better known by the bureaucracy these days as Imperial Center, were pictured in shades of yellow or orange. Those were screened by the Chimera's more senior officers. The rare handful of vital or top-secret messages coming from the senior admirals of high command, all of which were handled by Pharaoh personally, moved into the range of darker shades of red or purple. And the few the very few that came from outside the official Navy chain of command, the ones that went directly to Grand Admiral Thrawn himself, were an unremittent black. And they were never good news. The Altai Defender program is at risk, Grand Moff Tarkin intoned. Standing just inside Thrawn's office, with the image from the desk hollow projector facing away from her, Pharaoh couldn't see Tarkin's expression, but she could see Thrawn's, and the subtle hardening of those facial muscles sent a small shiver up her back. Orson Clinic has been quite persuasive, Tarkin continued, about diverting the funding to his own project, Stardust. 